History is past politics, and politics is present history. Edward Augustus Freeman. These words were displayed on a banner in my history classroom when I was in sixth form. For Americans, sixth form is the last two years of high school, where you study your A-levels. I'm saying this now because I know political has become a dirty word recently, but you know what? I like talking political. And we can't talk about Anne Boleyn without bringing up centuries of demonising women and the way we as a society commonly depict women on screen. So, if you hear political and are one to stick your fingers in your ears and hum, go no further. Because in part four of my Anne Boleyn coverage, I'm working through our perception of her throughout the centuries, along with the tropes that have risen as a result. If you like this video, please leave a comment, like, share and subscribe, and I hope you're looking forward to the rest of The Six Wives. In the nine years that Henry was on the throne after Anne's death, it was borderline treason to mention her. The Catholics at court revelled in her demise, believing this was the first step towards halting and maybe even reversing the Reformation. Indeed, without Anne to encourage him, Henry stopped at dissolving the monasteries and confiscating their wealth so he could invade France, and was in favour of burning people who acted a little too Protestant. It's not clear how she would have been viewed during the reign of Edward VI, but seeing as his mother replaced Anne, I can't imagine it was all too positive. As for Mary I, she would almost certainly have sent Anne to the stake to be burned if she was still alive, just as she went out of her way to burn Cranmer. Mary never forgave and never forgot. Though she locked Elizabeth in the tower, she knew she couldn't spite Anne by executing her daughter, because it would make her a martyr to the Protestants, who only converted to Catholicism to buy time. I don't doubt that Mary loved her sister, but the paranoia of not carrying on her bloodline to continue making England Catholic again would cloud her judgement. When Elizabeth came to the throne, it was best not to mention Anne at all. You couldn't speak positively about someone who had been condemned for treason. But at the same time, she was the mother of the Queen, so you couldn't denounce her either. Catholics in the pay of France and the Spanish Empire used Anne's soiled legacy to invalidate Elizabeth's claim, declaring everyone from Mary Queen of Scots to Catherine Grey as the true legitimate heir. Nicholas Sander wrote a damning history of Anne Boleyn, declaring her to have numerous deformities. To counter this, George Wyatt, son of... Thomas Wyatt Jr, who had tried to overthrow Mary to put Elizabeth on the throne, and grandson of Thomas Wyatt Sr, the poet who had admired Anne, wrote the first biography that portrayed Anne in a positive light. Unlike Sander, he had consulted people who knew Anne. When Elizabeth died in 1603, a ring was removed from her finger and discovered to in fact be a locket ring. To the surprise of those who opened it, they discovered a miniature portrait of a woman in a French hood opposite Elizabeth. As Anne was frequently associated with wearing them, it is reasonable to assume that this was Elizabeth's secret way of keeping her mother close. After her death, James VI of Scotland came to the throne, turning Wales, Scotland and England into Great Britain. By now, hardly anyone who would have known Anne at the time was alive and it was now common knowledge that Anne had been executed on trumped-up charges. But even so, to publicly denounce the mother of the last monarch would be to denounce the current monarch. The Stuarts were slightly less deadly than the Tudors, but until the late 17th century, you were best off keeping on the king's good side. After a couple of hundred years and anti-monarch idealism on the rise, it was no longer taboo to revile Henry VIII for his outright abuse of his powers. Britain slowly became a constitutional monarchy while George's 1-4 to four ruled. This would be the first time a Prime Minister could be elected, granted only by a handful of fat rich white men, but baby steps. Historians depicted Henry as a tyrant and a brute, which is an image that has lasted to this day. We think fat sociopath first, not religious reformer or poet. Anne, by contrast, was considered a romantic victim, which would inspire the narrative of her being pushed in front of the king by her power-hungry father and uncle. King George III was a considerably bad monarch, trying to assert monarchical authority. This, including the current corruption of the kings of France and a long, 
long history of monarchical authoritarianism, in which Henry VIII must have stood out the most, not just because of his size, sparked revolutions in America and France, where another queen would lose her head. Like Anne, she was vilified in her lifetime and after the fact. With the rise of Gothic literature, where innocent ladies were murdered by jealous stalkers and ravens wouldn't shut the hell up, Anne was almost a figurehead for a haunted soul never to rest. Authors like Jane Austen and Agnes Strickland viewed Anne as an intelligent woman who was sacrificed by the smothering shadow of male oppression. Elizabeth Benger wrote another positive biography of Anne, along with Selina Bunbury, which was called Star of the Court. Queen Victoria was also fascinated by her. Hence, she took a special interest when the Tower of London was renovated and Anne's unmarked grave was uncovered. And yes, because I forgot in my rankings video, Gaetano Donizetti, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, wrote an opera about Anne in 1830 named Anna Bolena, one of four operas written by the composer which took place in the Tudor era. The opera depicts a love triangle between Anne Henry VIII and Harry Percy of Northumberland. Like most operas, it doesn't have a happy ending. Anne would still be given the respect and sympathy given to her in the past, but as feminism rose throughout the 20th century, historians and writers revealed her intellect and ambitious nature. Eric Ives has become one of the most reliable sources when it comes to studying Anne's achievements and plans for religious reform. With this more intricate look into Tudor politics and culture, it was discovered that Anne was probably the biggest feminist of her time. It sucks that the environment she tried to thrive in ultimately killed her, but as a result, she is seen as one of the earliest examples of a feminist activist. And Let's face it, it's not uncommon for an activist to be killed by those who benefit from the status quo. I'm sorry to say that I completely forgot about Shakespeare's Henry VIII when it came to Catherine of Aragon. I literally only remembered it when my Anne Boleyn rankings video was rendering. In my defence, Shakespeare's Henry VIII is hardly the first play you think of, or even the first history play you think of, when it comes to the Bard of Stratford. We usually remember it as Hunchback, We Happy Few, I Know Thee Not Old Man, Death of Kings, and the rest. This may be an unpopular opinion, but with the exception of Richard II and Richard III, I find the history plays are so boring. Plays are too long. I mean, Richard III was nearly four hours. <laughs> People cheered. Yeah, they were glad it was over. <laughs> I love Shakespeare, don't get me wrong, but give me my donkey heads and cross-dressing and exiting pursued by a bear any day. The histories are mainly just people standing around talking for over three hours. Henry VIII was one of Shakespeare's final plays, but he didn't write it by himself. This was a collaborative effort with John Fletcher, the playwright who went on to succeed Shakespeare in The King's Men. A passing of the torch, if you will. Honestly, this play is kind of a disappointment. I went in expecting King Lear meets A Winter's Tale with a dash of Hamlet, but it's as boring as Measure for Measure, and Measure for Measure is really, really boring. There is a reason for it, unfortunately. Shakespeare's history plays were not written as a recreation of historical events. They were propaganda to justify and revere the reign of the ruling monarch. Perhaps in some future age, despotic megalomaniacs will not secure power through lies, false news and the rewriting of history. In the case of Henry VIII, the play depicts Howe as a jolly yet charming ruler who was persuaded by Wolsey to execute the Duke of Buckingham under false charges of treason. So it wasn't Howe's fault, he was manipulated. Related. Poor baby. Of all the people to be made into a passive protagonist, I never thought it would be Henry VIII. It's also Wolsey that convinces him to divorce Catherine of Aragon, but he soon realises he's been manipulated and fires Wolsey, but this is to justify his rage. After that, his only significant contribution, besides marrying Anne, is giving a ring to Cranmer to call out his counsel for infighting. The play ends with the birth of Elizabeth, where Cranmer delivers a long, long monologue about how Elizabeth will be an awesome queen and the monarch to come after her will be even more awesome. 
Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Who will succeed Elizabeth I and become patron of the acting company that Shakespeare would write for? Hmm. I do regret forgetting about it, however, because this play gives Catherine of Aragon more than her fair share of screen time. Maybe after I've done the rest of the wives, I'll redo Catherine of Aragon's and I'll include it in the rankings. It's very strange to see Catherine get so much focus and for Anne Boleyn to have such a minor role, when the case is usually the opposite. Anne has more in common with Jane Seymour in this, where she is meek and demure and gentle. She only has one significant scene in Act 2, where she confides in her old attendant that she doesn't want to be queen. At this point, Henry hasn't officially started courting her yet. But then Anne gets told she is now Marchioness of Pembroke. Yes, this is the turning point where Henry marks Anne as his next wife, but it seems as if it came out of nowhere. Anne is still reluctant and ill at ease, obviously hinting at her untimely death. Anne does appear in later scenes, albeit silent and part of a crowd. She isn't even present at the christening. During her coronation procession, two guys watch her and compliment on her appearance before she disappears. Talk about a missed opportunity. Anne Boleyn, as told by Shakespeare, would have been something of a mix between Goneril, Lady Macbeth, Kate, as in Kiss Me, and Hermione. Stan Lee had larger contributions when he did cameos in the MCU movies. Imagine the verbal banter between her and Wolsey in iambic pentameter. Imagine Henry trying to woo Anne by talking in sonnets, with each one having a malignant double meaning, likening his love to death and violence. I'm not mad, Will. I'm just disappointed. You see this portrait, and you take it as a given that this is what Anne Boleyn looked like, right? How about this one? Maybe this one? Well, they're all wrong. There are actually no surviving portraits of Anne that were made in her lifetime. Oh, I'm sure there were portraits made. You don't spend a decade as the most famous woman in England and not sit for at least one. But in the big transition between replacing her with Jane Seymour, any traces of her were covered up as quickly as possible, and that would have meant destroying her portraits. This is a common act when replacing someone of high political standing in a hurry and wanting to erase their contributions to history. In ancient Egypt, Hatshepsut's stepson chipped her name from the monuments built during her reign. In ancient Rome, statues' heads could easily be removed whenever the current emperor was murdered, which was very useful in the year 193 AD, when there were five emperors in one year. And anyone who has studied Stalin's Russia for more than five minutes knows about his personal brand of Photoshop. Similarly, her jewellery would have been melted down, sold or given to Jane. Her bee necklace, if it even existed, is believed to have been given to Elizabeth. The only images of Anne from her lifetime is this medallion, which was either defaced or worn down over time, and this sketch by Holbein. So what did Anne look like? She definitely had black or brown hair, which was likely so long she could sit on it, as many of the women at the time would have had really long hair. She also had brown eyes, which she passed down to Elizabeth. Fortunately, this one thing has remained consistent throughout her on-screen incarnations. A few actresses have blue eyes instead of brown, but this is usually because some people cannot wear eye contacts and it's forgivable. While I doubt Anne would have been an absolute 10 like Natalie Portman or Charlotte Rampling, she wouldn't have been ugly. She would never have been allowed to come to court in the first place if she had the wen on her neck or the protruded tooth that was claimed by Nicholas Sander. A Venetian diplomat described her as swarthy, with a long neck and wide mouth and a bosom not much raised, and eyes which are black and beautiful. A servant of Wolsey said she stood out because of her excellent grace and behaviour. One of her favourite clerics, John Barlow, called her eloquent and gracious and reasonably good-looking. From these accounts, I'm willing to think that she was reasonably attractive, but, of course, because someone's view of beauty is subjective, People who liked her would describe her as beautiful, and people who hated her would take her flaws and exacerbate them. In truth, it wasn't her appearance that was her greatest asset. It was her intelligence and her personality. She is repeatedly described as having great wit and excelled in manners, attire and tongue. Meaning she brought out her best inequalities by dressing to impress, so she stood out from the rest of the court, spoke cleverly as she'd been educated, and behaved in a manner that some admired in a woman and others didn't. There was no sixth finger. 
I'll say it again for the people in the back. There was no sixth finger. This belief that Anne had an extra finger, a la Christopher Guest in The Prince's Bride, comes from Nicholas Sander, the Catholic propagandist. Not only did he describe her with an extra finger, but she also had a protruding tooth and a wen on her neck, also known as a, a Sebacchia cyst or a Sebacchia cyst, which she hid with a high neckline, which was popular fashion at the time. One, high necklines weren't popular in that part of the 16th century. As you can see from these portraits, the necklines were commonly square-shaped with ample space to display the lady's bosom. The more modest among women would wear a petticoat to cover the neckline if necessary, or a thin layer of silk. Two, what Anne really had was a double nail. This is where another smaller nail grows from the bed through the cuticle. It can happen on any finger. According to the International Journal of Surgery Open, link in the description, it states that a double nail can be congenital or acquired. It can be painful, but even if you have one, doctors advise having it removed to remove risk of infection. Anne wore long sleeves to hide it from people watching her closely, but if you weren't looking for it, you probably would never notice. And three, if Anne really had all these malformities, do you really think Henry would have wanted to put his member in her and stir it? Think about it. Hey, also I have an extra finger! <laughs> this isn't my hair! <laughs> Remember ladies, when the most powerful man in the country starts writing you a ton of letters, stops guys you actually like from coming near you, and swearing that he is in love with you despite the fact he is married and has at least one child with someone who isn't his wife, it means you were chasing him out of a happy marriage which tore the country apart and it's all your fault. Oh, by the way, I was being sarcastic. Well, duh. Let's be clear here. It was not Anne who put the idea of ending things with Catherine into Henry's head. This marriage was shaky from the start. Henry VII had to get a dispensation from the Pope just so his son could marry his dead brother's widow. But even then, it wasn't until Henry VII died and could stop being stingy about Catherine's dowry that the two could marry. But as long as Henry and Catherine could have children, this possible incest wasn't a problem. But of course, there was only Mary. And so once Catherine reached menopause, it was likely then that Henry and Wolsey started discussing an annulment. Henry pursued Anne as he pursued his other mistresses. Unfortunately, there are no replies to the letters he sent to her. Either they were lost or destroyed. As such, we don't see her side of the story, which, which is why in the dramas we see such a varied interpretation as to how their relationship developed. But given that between 1526 and 1528 she left court and returned to Hever Castle for at least a year, I'd imagine she was trying to avoid his advances until he gave up, as opposed to leading him on and teasing him by flirting and denying sex. Ugh. Men have always assumed that a woman is playing hard to get every time she says no to a man's advances or she's being difficult or a tease. Most of the time, a woman simply means no. And if you got that through your fat head, Harvey, you wouldn't be in prison right now. In 1527, Anne was, what, 26? Unmarried, no suitors. The marriage her parents wanted came to nothing, and the marriage she wanted was wrecked by Wolsey. In the meantime, the king wouldn't stop hounding her to be his mistress, and all of a sudden, rumours of the king seeking an annulment were drifting through the court. Well, it is a fact universally acknowledged that a king with no male heir must be in want of a wife that can give him a male heir, and likely denied Henry's advances because she didn't want to lose her virginity before married and, and knew there were no long-term benefits of being the king's mistress once he got tired of you. But Henry wouldn't relent. So if it was truly Anne's idea to put herself forward as the next queen, it was a risky move. Remember, she had just been denied marrying an earl because Wolsey thought she was too lowly for him. Henry could have easily laughed in her face and gone for a French alliance, but no, the gamble paid off. This one sparks off so much debate. When the news of Catherine of Aragon's death reached Henry and Anne, Anne did in fact say, now I am indeed queen. Her enemies took it as proof that she had orchestrated Catherine's death via poisoning, but we all know now that wasn't true because she actually had heart cancer. But she's not the first person who said something potentially problematic. Henry himself said he was relieved that Catherine's death 
freed England from fear of war with Spain. So it was likely and meant what she said in a similar context as now people couldn't deny that she was now the king's wife. As the old saying goes, Henry and Anne allegedly wore yellow the very next day to celebrate. Well, okay, hear me out. Yes, Henry definitely wore yellow. He did not break down and weep at reading her last letter. This reaction by Keith Michelle's Henry is probably the most accurate where he crumples it up in anger. If Henry was indeed a sociopath, any tears wouldn't be real. Sociopaths don't tend to cry out of emotion. They tend to cry to get a rise out of your emotions. But according to Hayley Nolan of Anne Boleyn, 500 Years of Lies, there is no mention of Anne wearing yellow as well. And even then, if they both wore yellow, there could be another reason behind it, as yellow was considered a mourning colour in Spain at the time. Plus, this whole thing was claimed by Eustace Chapuis, who, remember, wasn't too fond of Anne. <clears throat> Last misconception. Chapuis claimed that Anne wanted Mary dead so she wouldn't be a threat, but again, Chapuy comes from a very biased perspective, so let's look at some other accounts. In 1534, Anne went to see the infant Elizabeth, and before she left, she asked to speak to Mary and offered a reconciliation with the king if she would only recognise Anne as queen. Mary countered that she recognised no queen save her mother, but if the mistress of the king would intercede on her behalf, she would be pleased. I can't imagine Anne was happy about this. Again, Anne tried to extend the hand of friendship towards Mary at Eltham Palace. One of Anne's ladies told her Mary had curtsied to her when leaving the chapel. Not wanting to seem rude, she asked the same lady to deliver her apologies to Mary and say that the Queen wished that this would be the start of their friendship. Mary responded by passive-aggressively saying that the Queen couldn't possibly have delivered this message. A third time she tried to reach out by offering her condolences for Catherine's death. Mary told Anne she would obey her father as far as her conscience would allow, which was another way of saying, screw you lady, you ain't my real mom. So we can't ignore that Anne tried to reach out to Mary, but Mary repeatedly threw that back in Anne's face. And Anne, who was known to say disparaging things without considering the consequences, voiced a desire to curb her Spanish blood. Unfortunately, Mary never realised it wasn't Anne that was the cause of her misery until after Anne was executed, and Henry gave her one last chance to relinquish her claim on the throne. If she refused, she potentially looked at a death sentence, and she finally conceded. I understand that she didn't want to betray her mother, I do, but Mary learned the hard way that sticking to your honour and principles in the court of Tudor England was not a successful strategy for avoiding the scaffold. 